My guest today is most certainly one of sports broadcasting's MVPs. She's worked with some of the biggest names in football, such as Pep Guardiola, Neymar and Pele. Uh, and of course, the MMA giants, Cage Warriors and the UFC. So, Leila, it's great to get the chance to speak to you. I mean, just going through that, the, the list of those names there, it's like, wow. Uh, Sounds how, good, how do you, doesn't how do you, it? <laughs> Even I love the sound of that. Yeah, it sounds damn good. I'm I'm very blessed. I'm very lucky, and I'm always very proud to sit there and say, like, especially in football. Um, I remember when I was younger, I made a list of my favorite footballers that I wanted to interview, and and to sit here now and say I have interviewed Messi, Cristiano Ronaldo, uh, Pele, and Neymar. You know, like those four is is it's a joke. It's a jo it's just ridiculous. I can't even get it into my head. And, and it's brilliant. And actually, it keeps taking me back to one of my favorite events ever. I co-hosted the um, the best FIFA football awards with Idris Elba and in the front row for the first time ever. It hasn't happened since either, because obviously logistics and politics are very complicated in these events. But we had Neymar sat next to Messi, who was in turn sat next to Ronaldo, all three of the same in the front row. And I got to talk to all three at the same night as well. And it's just... It's insane. Anyone who, even if you're not a football fan, it gets crazy. You get that. You get how special that is. So I'm very blessed, very lucky, I'm very happy. And I loved your intro. Love it. Thank you. <laughs> Just quickly as well, I know we were chatting a little bit before we started recording, but how have you been finding lockdown three as it is now? Interesting. I'm, 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 it, it was tough right at the beginning because literally in one day, I had just phone call after phone call after phone call of cancellations and you're just seeing work and in turn money just disappear, you know? So that, that was kind of a very scary day. Um, I run my own business. I work for me. And so that's quite terrifying when, you know, how, when you run your own business, however, however much you're your own boss, you are at the, uh, at the disposal of the client, right? And you are working for other people more than ever before, I find. So um, it was quite frightening in the first week, but I'm, I'm very quick to adapt. I think the creative industry is very quick to adapt. And we have a real blessing in these times that we have mobile phones, we have the internet, we have digital. And as soon as football games started to shut down, you know, brands started to money out of TV because there's no game. So they want the no one instead of on a TV show game and um, a lot of brands pulled back and realized okay all these people are at home and they're all on their phones a lot more let's pump the money more into digital which is a direction we were going in anyway digital is obviously growing massively anyway and brands you know a majority of brands were kind of doing a 40 80 and 80 percent split towards digital anyway and across covid we've seen just so much more be pumped into digital, which for me is the best thing because I am a digital first presenter and I love creating um, content in a more forward thinking, different way. And um, yeah, I think brands allowed creators to be a little bit more free because we had to be, we had to, we had to adjust, we had to adapt and we had to try new things that brands, you know, brands didn't know what to do. No one really knew what to do. So we weren't coming to us with pictures of, right, this is our plan for the year. They came to us and went, right, what the hell are we gonna do? And so I think a lot of influencers, a lot of creatives, a lot of producers could actually give their opinion a bit more and try some new things and take more risks. Yeah. So that has been the silver lining on it. Um, but it's hard. I mean, people are like, it's a, it's a t tough time for everyone. We're just trying to focus on the positives and keep adapting. Um, for me personally, I love to write. I create a lot of my own content and this has given me an opportunity to make my own shit more because, oh, am I allowed to swear? I'm a foul mouth woman. Okay, good. I just realized, um, yeah, it, it gives me the opportunities to make my own stuff more because I'm not constantly traveling away and working for other brands. So but that I always have, oh, I want to make this show for my Instagram, or I want to make this clip for my YouTube, or I want to make this podcast, but FIFA are paying me to go to Barcelona this weekend. Which are you going to do? Do you know what I mean? You have to, you have to work, you have to go with the brands. So often and you know i'm lucky enough to be working so much that i'm not able to do the creative ideas that i have um but covid has sort of given me the ability to start 
spending the time on my own projects more um and they've done really well so i'm happy yeah that's great and i mean as you were saying there like for, for all the negatives that it's brought for this industry in particular it's really sped up those developing technologies like you know digital content and, and podcast well yeah. before getting on to things like that uh, and a more career orientated conversation i'm sure you get plenty of media grabs asking you generic questions so i've come up with three just random quick fire questions just for a bit oh, wow. okay okay right firstly obviously you're with your brazilian roots so who is your favorite brazilian footballer of all time excluding neymar because i know you've done a lot of stuff for Neymar. I love that you say excluding Neymar straight away because you know that's the route I'm going to go down. Um, I would have absolutely said Neymar because I find him so inspirational and I love the way he goes about like, quite a lot of different things as an encompassing player. But my favourite footballer of all time, not including Neymar, it has to be Pele. Okay. And I know it's such a kind of classic answer. Or El Phenomeno Ronaldo. Um, because I remember that World Cup so vividly. And I remember when he had, um, I think they said it was an epileptic fit, but don't quote me, but he had a, a problem in the changing rooms just before a game. Do you remember? And there were rumours that because of the brand deal that he has, he still had to play and this, that and the other. And the drama around that whole World Cup was so painful because you hear, oh my God, our number one player isn't, isn't going to play moments before the game. Um, and I found him such a phenomenal player to watch. It was real, it was real original, classic, beautiful, you know, Jogo Bonito, the Brazilian flary style. And, and it was a different kind of, kind of game then too, you know, we... We didn't see so many um, so many violent tackles to stop a talent, right? You know, like Ney is almost at the wrong time. If we had Neymar 10 years ago, people would be just like going, wow, all his little tricks and, and letting him fly. Whereas now we know how to shut that shit down. And the poor guy just gets, boom, you know, like, um, but I think in the past, there was almost an awe to a player like Ronaldo and Pele that, when, you know what, what he's doing is beautiful. I'm going to let him go. Like, that's cool. You know, like they wouldn't just go for the ankles, but mm -hmm. um, it's between Pelé and Ronaldo. I think probably more Ronaldo just because he was more my time, but everything that I watch of Pelé was out of this world. And, and I was uh, lucky enough to interview him in Covent Garden once and just being in his presence. You know how we say in Brazil, football's like a religion. Like no joke, being in his presence was like being amongst a God, you know, like everyone around the crying the way you see the teenagers with the Beatles way back you know people around him were crying his aura and he was he's older now too like he was he was a little slower and de delicate he's an older grandfather and, and and watching him walk in and just being like wow like, you get goosebumps seeing the guy so um yeah Pele and, and I liked his you know, I liked a lot about what he does. I like a lot about what he stands for and, and his journey. And, and I went to his, um, I went to Aminus da Vila Development School at Santos, which is where he trained as a child. And I sat and I saw the exact spot where he used to sleep underneath the bleacher seating. And I saw the buses that they, he used to catch and he didn't have shoes. So Pelé really has come from, um, when we say poor in the UK, like we don't have the experience of poverty that a third world country has, right? He really did used to come in with no shoes on and hope that someone had a spare pair that he could play in that day, you know, like, um, and he almost didn't go to Santos because he couldn't afford the bus fare and people helped him out to get him on the bus with no shoes on, do you know what I mean? Um, and Ney, Ney went to the same school and I've seen toilets where they were like, oh, here's a picture of Ney cleaning the toilets, right? He used to be cleaning the toilets after the game and they used to play these like penalty kicks and if you lost, you know, whoever would lose would clean the toilets that day. And, and they said, you know, Ney never came in here um, playing and winning all the time every day. None of these kids came here and was brilliant every day. Ney was cleaning toilets all the time. He lost all the time and that's why he's good because he had to clean those toilets all the time. And we're talking about grubby, like boy yeah. toilets. It's very different. I also went to Lillishall in England, which is where um, quite a few of the top English, um, English players went to. And it, 
it's, it's like a posh British boarding school. You know, her parents pay a lot of money for their kids to go there. And it is the complete opposite of the development school in Brazil. And the day I arrived at that development school, the bus was on fire. Some kids had set the bus on fire. So I arrived there and there's a massive bus on fire, people trying to put it out because that's their bus for the, for the football school, tiny little pitch. Um, and it's, you know, it's a very different world. And so I have a lot of, you know, an extra love for, um, for Pele and May and, and people who came through from that school because it's a special place. Yeah, definitely. I, I grew up idolizing Ronaldinho and, you know, the football culture is just, you know, it's something else, isn't it? You it know? is. So it is. next question goes Go out. Well. Sorry, you said quick fire and I absolutely oh, yeah, really well, take I, it. So. I, I, I much prefer doing long form conversations anyway. I've, I've been told. It, can you tell I talk for a living? I apologize. <laughs> over tight on time, so I just thought I'd condense them. But if you want to go on, you know, it's not a problem with me. Outside the realm, <laughs> outside the realm of sports, I just thought during the pandemic, what is the best film that you've watched or rewatched? This is like when people say to me, what do you do when you're not working? It's like, what's not working? You know, like, I don't really, I don't get a lot of chance. A lot of people say, oh, what's your best Netflix series? Like, I don't know, I don't watch it. Don't get a lot of time. Um, I, I, I'm kind of a binge watchy girl. I like to watch something and then watch it over and over. And my favorite movie of all time is Pulp Fiction, Tarantino film. Yeah. And I, if I had a night off, I've been putting that straight on. So I kind of repeat that film. I also quite like um, real crime stuff. I sound like I'm a little bit screwing the head, but I think quite a lot of people have the same desires and they enjoy that. And there's one, um, The Pizza Bomber on Netflix. What is it called? The Pizza? Oh, it's called um, Evil Genius. That's what it's called. And it's about an American case where a pizza a guy went to collect a pizza and had a bomb strapped to him in his mouth. Mouth, real story. So that that too. Okay, nice. I've watched, watched Pulp Fiction not too long ago, so I'm on the same way. Man, if I be there, so good. So good. And and the soundtracks. I love the soundtrack. Yes. Finally, going down the the MMA route. What do you think the best fight of 2020 was? Oh. It's, it's, it's difficult because when you ask what's the best fight, you kind of think of, do you want the fight as a whole? You know, like it's when people ask you Messi or Ronaldo, right? You're gonna have this debate forever. It's like oh, with Messi or Ronaldo, I'm kind of like, well, are we talking about the best player, or the best team player? Are we talking about the best goal scorer or the best winner? Are we talking about the best movement in football or the best, you know, like it can be so complicated. And so for me, when I love a fight, I've got to admit, I love a good finish. I want to see a good finish. And I know there are some people who love that war and battle, and I love a war and a battle. But if it's become a decision, it doesn't hold the strength to me that it does when there's a good finish. Uh -huh. What was yours? For me, the way you say you must prefer, say, a dramatic finish to a, to a decision, I sort of go down the narrative of... It was, it was a war, it was a decision, but at the same time, it wasn't a title fight, which shows how competitive the lightweight division was. Dustin versus Dan Hooker at the apex. Yeah. Which, you could just, just hear the sound of some of them shots and, you know, just it showed the spirit of both men, no end. It, it's also so unfair that you've asked me that for 2020, because look at 2021. 2021 has just given us so much. Like Holloway was an incredible fight. And like, I think, yeah, now 2021 is all I can think about because we've just had some incredible fights and it's just been mad and they're getting better and better. You know, like we, we're seeing as UFC grows and because, you know, UFC is huge, but MMA is still a niche sport. A lot of people keep forgetting this. It's still a niche sport. It's still not understood by the masses. You know, you still turn around to people bar the name Conor McGregor the majority of fighters people just don't know my friends don't you know know who these people are and and when they watch it there's still a lot that needs to be understood and learned to enjoy you know some a lot of people still think it's just like senseless violence right um so it's still a niche sport and, and as it's growing I'm starting to notice the fighters tailor even the way they fight 
the bonus structure is designed to help do that. It's designed to help people, you know, create what's good for television and what's good to grow the sport in entertainment ways. And, and we're seeing that more and more and more. And I think in 2021, we're going to see the more visually entertaining and crazy kind of finishes and fights because the media, the personalities, the brands and the bonus structure is tailored towards that. So I know the bonus structure has been there for a while, but people are sort of clicking now exactly how to get all eyes on them. And so the fight game is changing a little bit. And these long wars that end in draws, that end in decisions, although we love them, I think we're going to see less and less of that and see a bit more of the classic sport entertainment drama, which is not a bad thing. No, not at all. And I mean, you make some great observations there. And most definitely, I would say the, the production value of the UFC year after year is just getting higher and higher and higher. And one of the things that I've said previously, uh, not only have Dana White and co been the front runners in how to stage events during the pandemic, but their sort of, you know, their access to media, the way they allow media access and how open they are, as opposed to say football, is just completely different. And in turn, I think they do this in order to develop the, you know, the reputation and the, and the wider reach of the sport. So I know you've recently launched Voice Notes, which yes. is really, really innovative. I'd say I'd never seen a podcast in that sort of format and the concept of it being a, basically a WhatsApp group chat. So just tell me a little bit about it and where the idea come from. Thank you. Well, firstly, the words you're using are exactly what I wanted. I was at home and I was um, getting frustrated at emails from sports podcasts asking me to come on um, because they were all three men around a micro microphone. And when I was like, what's it about? It's like, oh, we just talk about life and everything. And I was like, OK, but they were all that repeatedly all the time and in sports you know, podcasting, it's all men all the time talking about everything. And I was like, I, I want to do something different. And I, I don't want my podcast to be again. You know, I had a podcast, it was um, Sugar Free Coffee with Layla, where I would interview fighters. I said, okay, well, you know, it's cool. And a lot of people do brilliant podcasts, but that's a saturated market. Try and break into that. Like now, it's maybe, you know, three or four years ago, but now to start to go into that, we need something different. Um, I had another podcast called Commando Mindset with um, where I run it with two commandos and it's all about a mindset of um, a winning mindset. They train football clubs and they train footballers and, and they're brilliant. Um, and that was fantastic as well. But when sport, I just couldn't find, I struggled to find something that was different and sounded different. And then I got on a plane, I was gonna go film Karate Combat and I was on a plane to Budapest. And I sat on that plane and I was like, right, I'm not getting off this plane without a new podcast idea because I'm getting fed up and it's, I'm losing time. You know, not having a podcast in this day and age is a bad business decision, you know, right? We, podcasts are pivotal, it's important and I enjoy it. For me as well, the idea of not being on camera is a really relaxing thing to be able to do my job, my jogging buttons and not put makeup on. Like I love that idea. So I really wanted to do a podcast and I felt that the MMA world deserved an entertainment podcast because we do this in football a lot. And in MMA, it's all very, um, very stats driven, very niche, you know, and for new fans coming into the sport, a lot of these podcasts are almost too geeky, almost too clicky, almost too heavy for them. Um, I love um, I, I listen to Fight Disciples all the time. I love Dan Hardy's channels. I love it all. But when we are talking about, and this is when people hire me, when we're talking about growing and we're talking about a young demographic who know nothing, guys who aren't in gyms training, guys who don't understand the, the grappling, you know, when we're talking about opening it up more, I'm doing basically what I did in football. In football, I'm not about to discuss the 4-4-2 formation. In football, I'm here to talk about the psychology behind the, the, the player and what's their home life like. And I get in a helicopter with Pogba and see what's your day-to-day -day like. And, and you know, we, we do what I call sport entertainment. And I feel that bar some of the wonderful things that UFC make like embedded and some of these clips, there's not enough sport entertainment for, for new young audiences. So I really wanted my podcast to be comedy, fun, light and, and help the fighters shine. 
And fighters have psychologically a very, a very complex journey with their fights. And whether they win or lose, any question is really quite deep and quite heavy when you talk to them, and as, as you, I'm sure you can understand. Um, so I was like, where's a space where we don't have to sit there and talk to them about their training camp and their diets and, and how they feel about being knocked down in front of their whole friends, family and country? You know, how can I do this in a way? So I sat on this flight and I refused to get off and I thought this is going to end badly if I don't come up with an idea. And the main thing I was sticking to was because of COVID, not being able to have guests at home. Um, I have a beautiful kit that is all like the best high end sound kit but I'm not gonna be able to get people to come to me. And when we talk about sound, I get quite frustrated sometimes because I love to listen to podcasts in my car. And if I'm driving and the outside is noisy and all the sort of different sounds, the sound quality has to be like 10 times better for me to accept this. So I just wanted to know when, where is it in our lives where an atmospherical sound we're gonna be forgiving with? When will we be forgiving with that? So whenever I'm filming for TV, and you can hear a siren, we have to stop and film it again. When I'm filming for TV, you can hear a plane, you have to stop and film it again. But if we're seeing a bicycle go past behind me and they're making like that ding ding sound or their bell, well, if I can see it, then the sound is justified. It's atmospherical and I'm not that bothered. Do you know what I mean? So when we're watching TV, we're not bothered by sounds that are explained and that we can see. And then I clicked as I was on the plane, I was like, voice notes. When I send a voice note to my friend, the sound's atrocious. Like it's not high end in any way. But no one ever minds. No one ever's bothered by that sound note. No one ever sends a, uh, sends a message back going, do you mind recording your voice note in a quiet place? Because I can hear an echo and it's bothering me. Do you know what I mean? That doesn't, it just doesn't happen. It's a space where we accept a low quality of sound casually because it becomes like a conversation. Um, in a restaurant, if people are making a lot of noise, we almost move. Like I don't want to sit next to the loud oven or whatever, we'd move. But, some reason, and I don't know why, in voice notes, we just don't care. And so I thought, right, that's the way that I can do it in a way that's forgiving for people. Also, in football, whenever I do interviews, everyone's always asking me, like, oh, ask Jesse Lingard about the, the Man United WhatsApp group, you know, ask so and so about their WhatsApp group. And I know it with my friends and my, especially my lad friends, when they've got their like, tinder whatsapp groups they're chatting about the girls they're dating or whatever i'm like i love having a look at that i want to eavesdrop and snoop on that it's interesting and it's fun and and it's also a space where you're kind of a little bit politically incorrect and you just let loose mm. so i kind of wanted to combine the two and then i realized gosh we can sit at home because with molly molly mccann darren stewart and ian gary they're all like our genuine friends and when we do, when we used to do Cage Warriors, because of course Molly and Darren are now in the UFC, we would, after fights, sit down and have pizza and watch UFC together. Um, now with COVID, we watch UFC and we're sending each other messages and we're naturally sending each other voice notes. So it was such a natural progression to turn around and say, guys, let's do a WhatsApp group and let's publicize our chats, our genuine, authentic WhatsApp reactions to the UFC fights. And, and they were in and they're our A team. And now it just got so exciting so quickly that we invite um, special guests for every show. And we have, um, yeah, so we have like lots of fighters and, and straight away fighters want to be on it, which is something that happened to me in football. I made a show years ago called Adidas Game Day Plus. And it was the first show that we made fight, we made footballers look badass on purpose make them look cool so we'd go to like tattoo parlors with them and, and stuff that made them look so good that we had players from first teams of Barcelona PSG Real Madrid phoning us saying can we be on that show and that's what I wanted I wanted to put fighters in a place that they want to be there and um, voice note has you know we're only on episode four and we've already done that fighters want to be on the pod and it makes me so happy and so excited plus from a selfish point of view, I get to watch the fights by voice noting friends and incredible fighters from around the world. So, you know, number one, if I'm having fun, then I'm happy. Yeah, definitely. And just on that, I just thought it's worth not uh, mentioning, given, you know, sports broadcast and being a sort of central theme through this. John Anik, by the way, what a broadcaster that man is. Like, seriously. I know. Was saying to me, mate, the other day, I think it was during the, uh, the Max Holloway Calvin Cater card. 
like he genuinely in a couple of years when you look back I think he's going to go down as one of the best sports broadcasters like across any sport ever but I don't think he's as gonna, he should I don't think he's going to get the credit he deserves because as you say it's still a relatively niche sport but just the way the exactly. guy flows okay. he's, he's something else now look if, if it was John Anik in football it would be Gary Lineker do you know what I mean um by the fact that Gary fought, Gary used to play football or whatever, like the, the story doesn't matter. Where Gary Lineker is placed now is very much the sort of role that John Anik takes, and he's brilliant. And I, I like him a lot. I enjoy it. Even just his voice is so perfect for it. And um, yeah, he's a brilliant man. He works really hard to, to be that brilliant. He's very knowledgeable. And and to have him as the first guest on the first episode of Voice Notes was such a win. I was so excited and I was really pleased. And he was amazing on it. I loved what he said about his moustache and, you know, hearing John Annick say, yeah, I don't want to look like a paedophile. Like, that, you wouldn't hear that any, anywhere else, right? Um, quite a few people messaged me about, oh, wow, John Annick really was, like, he let himself loose on that pod. And I was like, yes, it's good. It's, that's exactly what it's about. And so, yeah, seeing different elements of people's characters um, was great. And John, John is, yeah, I'm so proud to have had him on the first podcast. Yeah, definitely. And it's that given that personal insight into especially athletes. Uh, and as you say, if you're targeting a new audience, given that insight um, you know, for potential younger audiences, get getting them familiar with an athlete as a person, I think it keeps yeah. me to root for. Um and I have got to say, especially the McGregor one, it was fucking hilarious. Like, it's, it's great. And we leave everything in, you know, we, we try, I edit, what what I edit is like waste of time stuff, because sometimes we get caught up in like, oh, my TV's got working, and oh, I'm on a delay, you're seeing this before me, and oh, someone's rung the doorbell, and you know, I edit out some stuff like that just to keep it punchy and tight, um, but really it's, it's, it's completely authentic, it's practically uncut, and um, it's also really important to me that we always have a, de a developing fighter, I think that's kind of a patronising term, but someone like Ian Gary, someone who's not in the UFC, um, a prospect as it were, and um, Ian Gary's part of our A team, this week we've got Paddy Pimlet coming in as well, um, Robbie Fox from Barstool is going to be on the show. Luis Piana, the Violet Bob Ross is going to be on the show. Cody Garbrandt is going to do one soon. Um, we've got loads coming up. It's so exciting. And it gives me an opportunity to WhatsApp these incredible fires as well. So I love it. I was going to say, um, but yeah. have you got one on for tonight for the UFC's resident Evertonian? Of course. So our 18 girl Molly McCann is fighting tonight, another Brazilian, which is painful because all she does is, is knock out Brazilians for me. Um, but yeah, Paddy is standing in. Paddy Pimlet, who's in the same next gen gym as Molly McCann, is standing in for Molly. Um, and we made her a little good luck animation. That's the other thing with our podcast, the animations. Do you like them? Yes. It, it, They're it, so it, fun. Yeah, it's great. And I mean, we're talking about all this and it sort of comes back to developing technology there's so much that you can do especially with audio content you know you can come around and and turn it into animation which is just exactly. another sort of positive of it and one of the things I, I wanted to ask you about um is obviously we're talking about you know the UFC here and you've hosted so many massive events for the likes of FIFA and the UFC I'd really be interested to hear in relation to your own experiences. Um, you touched on it a little bit before, but are there any principles that you've stuck by in developing your own brand and reputation in order to stand out to these globally recognized companies? Wow. Any principles that I've tried to stick by? That's a really good question. That's quite a deep question. Yes. Um, I guess it, it's sort of maintaining your truth um, for you, however hard it is, um, because sometimes it's all very shiny. There's a lot of money working with big brands and, and global brands. And if you're, if you're doing something that you don't think is fair or you're doing something you don't think is right, it is really important that you, you say no. Mm. Do you know what I mean? And that can be hard. It can be very hard when you're like, oh, that could... That could pay off the mortgage for a couple of months or that could do this or that could do that. Do I just swallow my principles? Do you know what I mean? So I think saying no is like the most important thing to me. 
and I came into MMA already having been pretty established in football and putting myself in a position where I, I know how to say no and I'm comfortable to say no and um, to jobs and to the way and the style and that gave me the ability to be quite disruptive and do things my way. Um, I mentioned this a little while back and I had to sort of think about it because I felt quite, quite uh, like maybe even bitchy saying it, but it's true. So I'll, I'll explain it again. Um, a lot of people watch me on Cage Warriors. I host Cage Warriors and they say to me, oh, like she's going to be like the next Megan Levy and push her through the Laura Sanko route and, and do that. And I, I love what they do. They're phenomenal. But it's not me at all. I'm, I'm definitely more digital. I'm more a fan voice. I'm not... I'm not a proper correct presenter, I'm different. And, um, and I have to be honest with myself with that. So when I turn around and said to the UFC, look, no, let's, let's do something different. I wanna do my own show in my own way and, and with COVID in my own home, we created five reasons why. I, I pitched this idea to them and five reasons why is quite a tongue in cheek, lighthearted alternative take on five reasons to watch the UFC. I don't sit there and say, watch it because this man's had, you know, he's nine and oh, and he's the best thing since sliced bread and he's clever because of that. Like I don't go through technical stuff. I tell you about how Murphy uh, was shot twice in the face when he was younger and spat out the bullets. You know, I, I find that one clip that Overeem wants smashing up a bicycle with a sledgehammer. And, and we, we try and link these very different, again, sport entertainment style ways and that is me sticking to my principles I guess that's me making sure I'm having a good time because I think in television especially you can't portray that this is the best thing since last where you're having the best time and everything's amazing all the time if it's not true do you know what I mean mm. I'm avoiding a office job my whole life you know, I think anyone in the creative industry is avoiding the normal standard nine to five. And I've been offered some big jobs at the classic kind of Sky Sports news desk or at, at sports things. And, and, you know, these studio jobs are essentially the equivalent of a nine to five. You're going to the same studio every day. You're having to do the same show every day in the same format every day. And I'm in... I'm flying across to Monaco, I'm going to Paris and I'm filming all these different things with different people and I love the variation and the creativity. So the most important principle that I've stuck by is not going down a classic, lucrative and very well-respected route, even though that's what everyone would, would do and was think, has told me. I've had agents sack me and tell me I'm crazy for not doing it, but making what I love doing what I enjoy and, and sticking to my my truth. Exactly. And I think that resonates with me in that uh, we were talking a little bit before we started recording about you know my own background and uh, the university course that I've been on. And I feel like, you know, with all due respect to them, they've afforded me some brilliant opportunities. But the course that I was on was pretty much tailoring me to go down the journalistic route. Um, and I mean, there's personal reasons, obviously, you know, you'll know, being where I'm from, we're not exactly the most trusting of journalists, and, you know, you look at clickbait, you look at clickbait culture and everything that's happened there. Um, so I, I really just saw broadcasting uh, and presenting, in a sense, and yes, I know, uh, <laughs> I've got this voice to contend with, but it's really something that, you know, it's something that I really want to get into. I remember I've got a an uncle who who's an actor he's acted in a in a fair few stuff and i remember him the other year he turned around and he put his arm around me and you know i like what you're doing you can tell that your heart's in it but remember one thing speak slowly so okay no taking but just in that sense i guess are there any other sort of examples through your career of going through experiences where they're almost like learning curves in a sense where it could involve talent or it could involve you know um, a certain event where an, in an incident happens where you've picked up from it straight away and think that's not going to happen again in the future yes do you know what i feel like i le i learn every job and every day and everything that i do and i think maybe because like 
credit to me. It's like, not, not that I'm <laughs> not promoting people, but credit to me. Every job I do is pushing the boundaries so much. Like I do take the things that are a challenge. I do take the things that are different so that every job I do is a massive learning curve for me. I've never really done anything twice as well. Like I never really um, stick to one thing and repeat one thing too much. I guess going back to that, not wanting the nine to five vibes. Um, so every job I do, I come out of that. I, I come out of every job I do wishing I could do it again because I just learned now I know what I'm doing. Do you know what I mean? And, and I think in production, every show you make, once you leave, you go, ah, now I know how to change that and what I would have done. And, and it's like an editor. Editors can never stop editing. You can edit forever. There's always something better that you can do it. And, and I'm definitely one to pressure myself to want to make it better and better and better. So I would absolutely proudly say that I learned from every single job. But yes, there are some that have a definitely a much quicker and faster learning curve. And they tend to be in the football world under high pressure jobs. Um, with Adidas, we do something called super shoots where you have an asset and it breaks my heart. That that's how we refer to players in the world. But the asset will arrive for a very short amount of time and everything has to be done very, very quickly. Um, Messi, for instance, for a for, 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 um, uh, a super shoot with Messi we will have a stand-in um, and we will have in one massive room um, five or six setups for him to do the ad campaign for X brand for a year this interview for this many press and then that ad campaign for another one and another one and he gets them all done in one day and in that super shoot there will be a Messi lookalike standing in to get the lights right to get this right to get that right and, and Messi will arrive and it will be as tight as you have seven minutes and that's it. And that person has three minutes and that person has 30 seconds. I've seen a shoot with a footballer where the time scale was 30 seconds. And so it is an insane amount of pressure. Um, I had seven minutes with Messi and with different footballers, you get that sort of really tight time but it's the hours before when you're waiting because you get there like four hours early, right? You, you have to. Um, and it's those four hours before that you're just sort of, your mind is wandering and you're learning and you're seeing and you're understanding. And, and I think for me, the biggest learning curve was understanding athletes properly. And it was two people, it was Messi and Neymar. When I see the pressures that they are under to complete what they do and to understand how false the media image is and how hard they work. You know, it sounds glamorous. Oh, it's just 30 seconds and just seven minutes. Oh, but it was seven minutes, 45 times. Do you know what I mean? And, and to different brands and to different pressures. And, and that's on a day that, you know, if someone, if, if a footballer's grandmother or mother dies the morning of the shoot, you know, someone is phoning that footballer saying, you do realize this is a three million pound thing you are walking away from today. And there are pressures from brands that wipe your tears and turn the fuck up. That's how it is. You know, I've seen brands take the mobile phones off elite players that you think not in a million years would they do that because they don't like them posting about their dog. And they say, no, it's not on brand. We're not doing this. You know, there is an amazing amount of control over these people, an amazing amount of pressure over these people that is very frightening. Neymar over the last um, 2019, I think people will know, has had a, a very tough year. And, and seeing how he has to deal with it, seeing his mindset um, and seeing those shoots. Just recently I saw a shoot that um, a footballer did. I don't want to name because I don't want to upset the brand, but you can see on the brand's photos, um, it was like an underwear campaign. And you can see on the photos marks all down their legs where they've just had the, the wraps, the pressure wraps on. That I think they're like cooling gels and pressure wraps for injuries. And it's like, wow, he didn't even have enough time to let that mark. You know, like when you wear tight socks and it leaves a mark on your leg, that mark, you know, we know it's like less than five minutes that thing will go down. That player didn't have enough time to let that line go down that this underwear entire campaign going on buses and everything has those marks on. And we're sitting there going, oh, look at the nice life, bet they make a load of money having that. It's like, no, that, that player didn't have enough time to, to to even let the marks go down. That's the pressure that they're under. It's an insane amount. And when I saw that and I learned to understand what they're like, 
it changed my whole technique about how I talk to them, how I word my, my work and how I interview them and, and how, you know, we have to sort of just respect other humans anyway and how we don't know the story. And, and um, I think because the way I talk to them, the way I do my interviews, it does work really well. And I do get on with athletes really well. And, and they ask for me back and I get the best jobs with the athletes and the deepest things. And I get to do the uh, day in the life of because I get it, if that makes sense. No, so the biggest learning curve was really seeing how how much pressure they're under yeah definitely and i think that's one of the real the positives in regards to your work as, as compared to many others is that sort of personal touch of get letting the athlete feel at home getting them feel comfortable and, and as, as you outlined there these sort of brands and sponsors have so much sort of I don't know, power monopoly over yeah. the individual that often you know media obligations like you can tell how you know rigid and hard certain athletes have been media trained you know so if you give them the opportunity to sort of let loose a little bit and be themselves I think not only is it good for you as the presenter but it, it's brilliant for them to show a different side to themselves and feel you know a lot more comfortable exactly and, and these these come from a positive place too, you know, so to calibrate what I'm saying. It's like, these are brands that the players want to be part of the brands. The players are being paid very handsomely to be part of these brands. Um, and the players are, you know, living a very luxurious life and, and, and they, they are choosing to be in this deal. Absolutely. But we're talking about multiple brand deals, multiple football games, multiple, you know, uh, uh, agreements with the club. And, and every now and then you have to remember this is a 23 year old or this is a 21 year old who also gets pressures from home. And it's like, whoa, you know, I, I have all these people under my umbrella of care and, and all these demands on me. And, and it can be very, very heavy. And this is, a, a, you know, these are people who are young and competitive and just want to play football. And so things, things are pressurized. And that's the same in MMA, you know, the pressure in MMA and the, the, the money in MMA isn't quite the same as with football, but it's getting there, it's changing. And, you know, the young Ian Garys of this world is starting to see, you know, someone like Ian who is, um, has that charisma and is very much the brand kind of boy, you know, brands are gonna fall over him for sure, already are. Um, you're gonna start to see that pressure affect these young guys and see how they deal with it in a different way. But um, yeah, the mindset behind athletes is something that I think the general public really don't get. They really don't understand. And one of the biggest things that frustrates me is seeing the insane bullying online. Um, whenever I do shows, so I do quite a lot of these, like um, I think we did it for Budweiser during the World Cup as well. These shows where we just sit and chat about football games and, and, and chat about what's happening in the world. And I almost always have someone, generally an influencer, turn around and goes, oh, I hate him, he's shit. And I'm like, sorry, he's what? He's shit. And I was like, all oh, right, it, like break that down. I will always make someone break that down. Because turning around and saying he's slow on the wing, turning around and saying he's weak at penalties and, you know, therefore our team loses, fair right? You can say the facts, but just calling a footballer shit, that's just, that's weak. That's just bullying. That's just, you know, you, you have to back that up if you're with me. Um, and, and the same, I do shows that take the piss out of footballers, but I wouldn't say anything that isn't, that I wouldn't say to their face, you know, and you can sit in front of a football and go, man, you had a terrible game. That was awful. Why were you so slow? Have you, did you eat too much? Like what was going on? You can sit and have that conversation but you can't just bully people. And when you see on Twitter, the way people talk to footballers is, it, it's gone way too far and they forget that they're human. Yeah, I mean, it's almost that celebrity culture, isn't it? We're seeing it, it's sort of gripped sports as a whole. And as you were saying, there's always one dickhead. Now, I mean, I think this, that's an interesting time to sort of bring this into it as I was interested to find out. Uh, I'm interested to find out from, you know, everybody that works in the industry space in general um, because you know the lines are so often blurred between personal interests and you know profession as it were yeah. like, the majority of people that do work in sport find it you know immensely interesting as a whole and no doubt they grew up watching and always wanting to be involved in sport 
like take me for example you're talking about not wanting to work for what a nine to five ever since i was knee high it's all i've wanted i just want to work in sports end of but as i'm getting older case in point being for example when liverpool won the league and the champions league the other year i just wanted to get away <laughs> like you yeah. just you need a bit of a break from it sometimes yeah i think one of the things that's been brought on from this pandemic um, it's almost related to digital media as a whole is that I would absolutely dread to see my screen time over the, you know, the last couple of months. You know, so I was wondering, how, how is it, like you said before, you know, the lines are often blurred for you between you know, downtime and, and work. How do you refresh yourself uh, and sort of get yourself sharp again if ever you're feeling a bit fed up? Two things. Um... I don't get it right. I don't think anyone does. It's it's always going to be pressure. Um, the digital era and the fact that our phones, you know, except for when you're in the shower, can always be calling you and demanding things from you is, is tough. Um, but two things. One, the fact that I have football and MMA, um, I can cross over in between the two is, is very beneficial to my mental health um after the russia world cup i didn't want to watch another football game ever again i was like i'm done i'm sick of it you know uh, even the brazil world cup the best opportunity of my life i got to go to brazil and make tv shows for two different contracts i hosted a show with david beckham it was ridiculous at the best time but also it's every single you know uh group stage it's every knockout game it's everything and by the end of it i was sick of football and i was like i don't want to watch another thing i don't want to talk about another thing and it's it's kind of it's normal to feel that way when you know your whole month has been obsessively around it thankfully because i have mma i can flow into that and so when people ask me like oh which is your favorite it's like it's, it's, i love them both because i have them both and i think if i focused on one all the time i'd probably become like hating it mm -hmm. so the fact that i have two and i flow between the two is the first thing that helps with that kind of pressure and the second thing is gratefulness it really is because it's very easy to have this kind of like cup half full cup half empty syndrome where you know Look at five reasons why the show that I make for the UFC, I created it, I film it, I edit it, and I send it across to Vegas. They then put B-roll on and graphics and they put it out. So there's a lot that I'm doing on that. The time pressures are really important because it's got to come out right at the right time for the event. But equally, I can't film it too early because sometimes fights fall through and change. So it's a nice small window in which I've got to make it. Um, when I write it, I'm so adamant that I want to make it different to everyone else that I've got to find some random story and not every fighter has the most amazing stories. So it's precious in, in getting the right, the right story. Um, but also I then have to edit myself, which is an absolute head fuck for anyone. It's the worst thing in the world, isn't it? It's really not normal. <laughs> And so that's very difficult and it makes you kind of want to just refilm everything a million times and, and you notice things about your ears that no one's ever noticed and it isn't important and it's just so strange. So that's an absolute head bug. But then I have to just sit there and go, okay, you know, in one, with the cup half empty, I absolutely hate it. It's too much pressure. Why am I looking at myself? Why am I trying to do this? Who the hell do I think I am going to the UFC to selling a show when there are, you know, incredible talents out there who haven't done that? And then the other half is like, actually, I make a really funny show. I'm really enjoying myself. I'm so lucky to be doing this. Um, let's just enjoy it right now and have fun and practicing gratefulness. I'm quite religious. Um, I love to sort of pray and be full of gratefulness in my mornings. And being grateful in whichever way you can is so helpful, so helpful. And it brings back a little bit of... Um, rationality so sort of because we find ourselves we can be very irrational very quickly even with with that UFC show you know I was pitching it for like six months and we were trying to get the contracts right and my ideas and how I wanted it and da 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 and then as soon as you land that contract you get it you're like oh I've been telling them I'm the best thing like for ages now I've actually got to deliver that no, I'm terrified. Like, I, I, I'm, I'm fine selling myself and telling the world I've got this brilliant idea it's the best thing ever and then it's like shh got to do it got to actually get it right and it's got to be good that's like a ton of pressure landing on you so it's kind of a really weird feeling so bringing yourself back to being rational and going I didn't make this up for no reason uh, there's an actual thing I'm going to do and yeah so gratefulness kind of helps me be more rational 
and just remembering how lucky we are and actually none of it really matters. Do you know what I mean? I've got a roof over my head and I've got lunch today. So what if five reasons why it goes to shit? So what if my, if no one listens to my podcast? Like bringing it back to the really simple things mean I can be freer and have more fun with the things that I make because really it doesn't matter. Yeah. yeah. Amen to that. And I mean, gratitude, obviously it's massive. And one of the things I picked up on there, um, you said with five reasons why it took what, six months to pitch it? Yeah, it was six months from when I first started telling them, listen to me, I've got a good idea to getting it done. Resiliency that that, that that entails. And for example, the fact that you have to edit it and get it out there within you know a short window of time. It points to the this sort of digital media industry and such the array of roles that are available for people to go into uh, and for people to, to execute, you know. Um, some people want to be in front of camera, but sometimes they're better behind camera, just uh, as an example. Is this something that you always envisage yourself doing? Because now there's so much that the, you know, the job description entails, as it were. Um, and if you were to give us sort of a quick flyover of your career, what do you feel like some of the key skills that you've picked up on along the way have been? So yes, is the answer. This is exactly what I always wanted to do. I'm a bit of a control freak and I'm very much a self-dependent person. I'm, I believe very much if you want it done right, do it yourself. <laughs> and I'm, I like doing stuff myself. I, um, I absolutely love grinding. I love working late. I love knowing that I put a lot of effort in for something to work. Um, gone are the days of being just a presenter. You know, we live in a world where you have to edit, you have to understand, even as a brand, like my Instagram, my everything, I'm a brand, I'm a presenter, I'm an editor, I'm a writer. Um, I have to PR myself. Like in the past, you'd have a presenter would turn up and read someone else's words off an autocue and they would have a PR team to PR them and they would have you know, everything else set so separate. And now that's gone. You know, of course, still in TV, people will write me scripts, but I have not in the last five years ever read a script that I haven't put my hand in and gone, right, let's make this more authentic to me. And I will do that on purpose. Even if someone writes me a script and I'm like, well, that's perfect. I'll want to change one word just to say that I have my hand because it's not fair, right? Like, I like to do something and make sure it's authentic to me. Um, so I, and I, I was naturally like that. And so I'm very lucky that I'm, I'm in a time and was born in a time, and that's just pure luck, that I was born in a time where that fits. So when it comes to my career, I kind of, I started off as a dancer and I wanted to be a dancer. Um, and then I moved out of home quite young and money was important to me. It was really important that I had to uh, find a way to live and survive and take care of myself. And um, I, I got a job doing a late night poker show. Um, so I was presenting live for long hours, um, live poker matches and poker games. And I, I was particularly good at poker. I love poker. So it was really um, a perfect fit for me. And I realized very quickly that presenting was a lot more money than my dancing dreams. Um, and I was in a position where money was important um, or had to be important. So I started off in poker telly. I then, um, I had a lot of friends in BMX and downhill mountain biking and I loved it. I never rode myself, but I was found the, the atmosphere and the people very cool and I enjoyed it. And one day um, a guy from a classic television channel came down to interview my friend who just happened to be the down, downhill world champion that day. And um, this guy's like missing teeth, tattooed, skinhead, you know, proper mountain bike visual. And this guy, the other guy was like a 40 year old, gray haired, proper journalist. And he sat him down, put up lights, did all this thing and, and had a really boring interview that my friend gave just the worst interview. He was nervous, he didn't speak well. It didn't portray the cool, you know, badass element of the sport in any way shape or form and I watched this interview and I saw my friend just being displayed in the worst way possible and it frustrated me and so I got out my little camera at the time it was a flip camera and I said to him as soon as the finished interview was finished because he was angry too he like, just was like oh I was shit I hated it I said let's do it again I said, do you mind let's do it again I want to do it with you and let's walk the course let's walk the course and let's talk about your win and we'll do it in a more casual way and thank God, like, because he's a world champ, it was just lucky that I knew him. And he was like, yeah, okay. 
And we walked the course and we did it. And I asked pretty much the same questions as the other guy, but it's about how we did it and the way we did it. And we had a conversation, he came across beautifully. And I audaciously sent that video to the channel that interviewed him with a letter about why I felt that mountain biking wasn't being represented properly. They called me up the next day and gave me a job. Um, and so I started working for a couple of different channels in extreme sports um, and grew my way that way slowly. I then ended up on like Sky Sports, Eurosport, doing cycling sports because that's what I'd fallen into. Um, and eventually it got to a place where uh, Danny Boyle asked me to narrate the London 2012 Olympic opening ceremony. Um, that for me was the big door opener into the sports world because as soon as I had done that there was a lot more faith and trust in me from big brands because it's like oh okay of 80,000 lives she can host with some of the biggest names in the world and go out to you know four billion television homes, homes. so as soon as I'd done that, that put a massive mark on my CV that just made every other job easier. And then I could start to pick and choose. And that's where I went, okay, the sports that I like, I want to do football. Bra little Miss Brazilian over here, I want to get in the football world. And, and so I purposely pushed towards football when the opportunities or when the doors opened for me. Um, and then I was doing football for a really long time and I was super happy in football. And there's nothing in my football career I would change. There's no other place I want it to go there's no dream job I want to have remaining in what I'm doing in football right now is the perfect perfect scenario for me and I'm so happy and I still do a lot in football I work with Red Bull I host Neymar Juniors 5 which is the world's biggest five-a-side league in Brazil it's in Brazil but it's the world's biggest five-a-side league I do stuff for the biggest clubs in the world and the biggest brands in the world and all the stuff that I do is is truly fun so there I'm happy and, and, I, and, you know, with the World Cups happening that can get kind of stressful and tired, I, I was like, mm, there's other places I want to do, there's other things I like. And again, the Brazilian genes of MMA, it's like this sport's what I grew up around. I do really like it. I never thought of it as a job because it is such a niche sport. Like um, I am pretty good off football and, and, you know, MMA doesn't have the kind of football budget. So it was always like, also there weren't, the shows weren't there and the women weren't there. And, you know, Caroline Pierce left to go to America to, to host that kind of thing. And in Europe, there were no women in Europe hosting, you know, MMA content. And that frustrated me. So I kind of got to a point where I was like, let's, let's step in there. Let's, let's have a little play and see where I can go in there. And, and I was blessed to have Cage Warriors back me and have faith in me and have me host their main show. And I said to myself, I want to give it two years and try and get something with the UFC. Within three months, the UFC gave me a call. So I was really lucky and I was obviously doing something right. But I think the something right that I was doing was that I was doing something different. And I think that's, that's what is interesting to people. So yeah, when you talk about being an inspiring presenter and, and where we should go, and what we should do, I think different is, is currency right now. That's great to hear, and I, I'm I am hearing a lot of similarities in that you know that self confidence and you know putting things on your own back and you know, the, the audacity as it were to turn around and say that interview was shit. I can do it better. There you go, and that work. And I look back and I'm like, what the hell were you thinking? But it was the core to my career. No, of course, and um, it's obviously come to your benefit now because ge genuinely in regard to you know the landscape of broadcasters and presenters you certainly are up there amongst thank them. you now thank you I appreciate it and, that, and you know what I still do it today and it's important there's a new job I've got I'm not allowed to talk about it yet but um to get that job I saw something about it on Instagram and I was like hang on a minute they haven't got a presenter this is an epic idea I DM'd, I found like this, the guys who run it and I DM'd them. And the, when I look at my DM, I'm so embarrassed. I wrote, you know, you're making a big mistake if you don't include me in your audition process, right? You know, <laughs> something like that. I was like, you're, how are you looking for a presenter? And I haven't had a call because like, I am so on brand for this and it is so perfect for this. Whoever is running your casting is fucking up if I'm not there. And so, you know, I sent a really audacious message. 
I've got the job. And it was, you know, they'd been doing auditions for like six months. And I slid in at the last three going, wait, you've missed someone. You missed me. And um, I got the job. So I'm so proud and I'm so happy. And it does, it takes that, you know, don't just knock on a door, smash the fucking thing down. Like tell people you're good and show people you're good and prove to people that you're good. Um, Because you have to, you just have to. It's a highly competitive industry. And if you're not going to be that person, then someone else will be. Yes, miss. Now, final two questions to wrap up. Go for it. One, you mentioned there, you had almost like a bucket list of people that you wanted to interview, including, you know, obviously sort of Brazilian icons within football. Are there any left on that bucket list that you want to tick off? No. 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 I tick them all off. Would you believe it? I take them all off. Slatan was on it. Um, oh, I need to actually get it out because people ask me about this a lot. Uh, yeah, Neymar, Messi, Ronaldo, Pele, Slatan. There were a couple of older names as well from the past. Thierry Henry. Um, who else? There might be it was seven names, so there's one missing. Did I say Pele was on it? Yeah, I did. I think so. David Beckham, David Beckham. So yeah, those seven names, and I got to do them all. Yeah, that's that, like just from like a I guess like a fanboy perspective. That's just like a oh, because like you know you've got your list and it's like you know you want to make your way through them. And I know well, I'm what now twenty two, and it's genuinely I think especially when it comes to the men, uh, I think you know the women's niche is developing brilliantly with sort of you know spearheaded by people like yourself but with men I think it, it looks like an old man's game if that makes sense you know what I mean someone is the sort of you know the flagship face of you know a sport or whatever a broadcaster with a microphone in his hand you genuinely picture them being you know, that old journalist I guess it's yeah. in a time but I mean I've still got plenty of years to tick off before. you do you have so much time we all have so much time yeah you do you do often see them especially in broadcast television they tend to be older um because it takes that long to get there do you know what I mean it takes that long um but in digital now you know it's 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 changing in digital it's whoever grabs it whoever takes it and we've got some audacious 19 year olds <laughs> you know um, and in digital, I think it's more about the content and the idea and doing something different. But, you know, all these players are far more approachable. There's far more chance now than there ever was. Mm-hmm. You know, 10, 15 years ago, you had to go via the club full stop. Now it's via the club or any of the brands that they work with, right? It's sort of, it's starting to spread out. But now I mean, Marcelo has a YouTube channel. And he's doing collaborations with freestylers on his own YouTube channel. Ten years ago, that would never have been allowed. Never have been allowed. You know, the club would never allow someone to do that. So um, it, it is changing and it's varying. And if you have an awesome YouTube channel and you're a cool little freestyler or you're an incredible painter, you know, like um, at May's birthday party, he invited a guy to, to paint a big picture of him because he does this really weird kooky paintings that include photos of all his friends. And, and he found the guy on the internet. Do you know what I mean? And it's like, wow, okay. So now the opportunities have grown and changed and and there's every opportunity. So make your list and believe in it. Yeah, definitely. And I mean, that's some great tips for aspiring sports broadcasters. And I thought to end, just on a different note, rather than be generic and say, you know, any tips for media graduates and whatever, I wanted to ask if you could go back and speak to the younger Layla and give her any advice going forward with all these sort of changes that are ahead in the industry, what advice would you give? I know exactly what I want to say because I say it to people when they ask me a lot. One, one thing that I'd say personally to me is like, I would want to reassure my, my younger self and say like, you're on the right path. You're doing it all right. Because for a lot of the time you think, oh, I should do more. What else could I do? And we put pressures on ourselves. And actually, you're exactly where you should be, is, is what I tell myself. Um, I probably want to tell myself to be patient, um, but also be audacious, because audacious works. Um, I, I quite like that that's been a thread throughout our conversation today. But, you know, 
the amount of times I've not sent that message, you know, like I got this job from sending that DM and I got that mountain biking, my first mountain biking job from sending that audacious letter. But there were many times in between where I chickened out and I didn't send that letter and I didn't send that note or I didn't say that thing. And, and in meetings, you know, you sit there and you hear people talk and you kind of want to go, mm, no, I am the best because of this, you know, and it's hard, it's hard to say it and it's hard to do it. But I think, you know, if you're playing the game, gamble on yourself bet on yourself big um because you're the only one who can so be audacious gamble on you invest in you most well, certainly now Leila I just want to say thank you very much for taking time out of your weekend to speak to me I thanks for having me I really enjoyed it and in regards to the future um you're more than welcome to come on to the podcast and you know talk about football talk about MMA anything you want you're, you're more than welcome so we have the same loves so I think we could yeah we could definitely have many more conversations I really appreciate it I really appreciate what you're doing and thanks for having me on